we've come to the point in the conference when I let you know that we have put out address lists at the end. It's only re the re revision stage, however. Um, when you go into dinner tonight, the address list will be waiting for you on the mail tables. It will have your name and address and email address. We're assuming those are correct, but we're not positive. So please do check that off for us. Um, when you check your name, mark your initials beside it. If you say, yes, please share this. If there's any part of it you don't want to share or that we need to alter, please make the alterations. Leave us that note so that we can make those changes. And before you leave, we'll print out a copy of everyone so that you can be each other's pen pals from here on. And just a reminder that there will be a scholar photo in the backyard immediately following the reading. And now for Alan Meyer. Seems like only yesterday. <laughs> Can everybody hear me at that level? Thank you all for coming. I'm going to read a short scene from my novel, Tejano, and then I'm going to conclude with an older short story. The character who gathers together Tejano's several different narrative threads is named Gideon Jones. Gideon is a self-taught mortician, a peddler of lightning rods, and a would-be journalist. Following the novel's prologue, this is the first scene in the tale, so I don't think you need any explanations. This is Gideon's first day beyond the tree line, out on the prairie, where he's discovering that things aren't always what they may appear to be. Gideon Jones, The Way West, his treaty with Chief Bones, June 1865. His first day in the true wilderness, miles beyond the protection of civilization, Gideon Jones passed hour after hour traversing a wide undulating ocean of prairie where nothing altered his view. Late into the afternoon and still he espied no landmark, nothing by which he could gauge his progress. Anxious with anticipation of desert heat and savage beasts, and even more savage natives. He resisted feelings of panic, a kind of reverse claustrophobia, brought on by the boundless grass and sky that made him feel forgotten, even by the Lord above. His oxen and he seen the only sentient creatures in the universe. But the Creator must have taken Gideon's fear as prayer, for God placed on the distant horizon two dark spots. Gideon turned his wagon directly toward the two tiny shapes. Slowly, steadily, they became larger, two stationary humps. Not the appearance of an Indian raiding party, he convinced himself. Now the humps appeared shaggy on top. Maybe he was approaching two buffaloes. He cleared his Hawkins barrel of dried mud and grass. He was not sure how to dress a buffalo, but he figured he'd skin the hide to save it for cold weather and hack off and roast cuts of the meat until he learned by taste the ones to keep. By the time the unmoving shapes had become a solitary pair of trees, his mouth watered for buffalo steak. When at last he drew beneath the tree limbs, the horizon was streaked purple and orange. Of a sudden, the trees cried out. Shrieking black leaves lifted. A shimmering cloud of birds rose clear of the treetops, then sank back into the limbs. Beneath the raucous feathered trees, as oxen tired as they were, moved faster, and he saw the pool they had smelled for miles. The water's edge was packed mud bearing animal prints. Beneath the pale bark trees lay leaves serrated like the blades of knives. Scattered about were hundreds of bones and flat rocks with brown-red streaks he knew from his stint in a Baltimore asylum as bloodstains. 
He pulled hard against the reins, but couldn't slow the team. If this was bad water, his oxen were goners. He knelt at the pool's edge. The mud and bent grass were also stained red. His knee sank in the earth as he cupped a handful of warm water to his nose, wondering what poison water smells like. In the middle of the pool, deep as their bellies, his oxen stirred brown clouds of water. He swallowed, tasted grass. Grit settled on his tongue and caught between his teeth. He would, he would have to filter the water through his shirt tail into his keg and canteen. When the animals had drunk their fill, he managed to get them out of the water in the sucking mud. He unhitched them and with two lengths of rawhide, hobbled them in the tall grass beyond the trees. Left ox, you watch out for right ox. The beast lifted its muzzle and showed him what looked to be a questioning frown. Well, you are your brother's keeper. You too, right ox, you look after left as well. Right ox loudly pulled grass, snorted, and ignored him. He found enough dead wood under the trees to build a fire, and he boiled a pinch of coffee. There's no twilight out on the frontier. By the time his water boiled, the heavens were full dark, poked through with stars. Closer above, roosting in the trees, the scores of birds ignored his fire. After a while came the loud fall of rain. Rain he soon discovered to be the steady droppings of the birds. Of necessity a beast of burden, he took up the yoke of his wagon and pulled it from beneath the bird's sudden storm. Not ready to give in to sleep, he gathered four fallen sticks, bound them together, and set the ends ablaze. Holding the burning faggot above his head, he explored one side of the watering hole. Bleached bones littered the ground and reflected his flickering light as scattered shards of the moon. There were hoof prints he guessed to be buffalo, and other prints resembling a dog's, yet larger. In a sudden breeze, the sputter of his torch darkened and tilted the earth, and thinking the ground sloped up, he stepped hard, only to stumble forward over the same flatness. When the breeze expired, a flare of light illuminated something he saw for an instant as an ivory harp discarded by a careless angel. He knelt closer to what were the perfect curved bones of a human rib cage disappearing into tall grass. Before he could make any deductions, he parted the grass and stared down at a skull that stared back at him. He lowered his faggot. The skull lay cushioned in grass, the ribs sunk like the beached prow of a boat into the earth. He or she white or black or red, someone small if not young, grimaced in the jerking light. Arms and legs stretched out restlessly into grass and dirt, the prairie reclaiming one of its own. He walked back toward the coals of his cook fire, a dying star come to earth a hundred yards away. He collected his pot and tin cup, rehitched his oxen, and brought the wagon alongside his new comrade. Right ox, left ox. The words came from deep in his chest and were as breathy as the beast's mastication. Come meet a gathering of empty bones. The bones were mostly intact. One hand was unconnected at the wrist but had not wandered far. One finger was missing altogether but might have been lost long before this place. Gideon wondered why the wild beasts that frequented this killing ground had not disturbed the skeleton, male, and Indian chief, he decided. Perhaps the sand had hidden it then recently been blown away. It was as if the earth had secreted away these earthly remains 
that Gideon might discover them and pay homage. He wondered how long this fellow had waited for his arrival. Out here, sun and wind might rapidly reduce a corpse to bones. It didn't take long to unearth and load the skeleton into his wagon bed. The teeth were uneven and ground down to stubs. Maybe they were the teeth of one who'd hankered as much as Gideon after sweets. The skull revealed no cut marks, so he reckoned his new friend had died with his scalp undisturbed. Gideon's kinship with oxen thus expanded to include the chief and their little prairie family. He speculated whether his hospitality to a skeleton came natural because his own origins were not fully known to him. <clears throat> Orphaned, he had ended up in the Baltimore Asylum where he toiled for months and where he grew comfortable with the charms of the dead, preparing many of them for their final journey. No doubt solitude helped incline him toward the mortuary arts. After he came to learn the pleasures of reading and of writing, Gideon marked how he saw undertaking and journal writing as companionable occupations. The first preserves the corporeal, and the second preserves the cerebral. The fear of savages that had dominated his thoughts at the beginning of his journey had been diminished by day after uneventful day, miles and miles of nobody but himself. Now this blood-stained ground and the chief's bare bones resurrected that anxiety and he determined to reclaim the cautiousness he had steadily abandoned. He threw onto the fire the lar largest fallen tree limb he could find to build up flames to last long enough for him to sneak away with his entourage what he guessed was two to three miles. Safely moved, he once more unhitched and made fast for the night. <clears throat> he lay down beside his silent bedfellow and slept until the full moon waked him. All around, grass rippled in bone-colored light. Seed pods, bright as the foam of ocean waves he had read about, but had never seen. He listened to distant howls he knew as coyotes, but in his imagination, these sounds became the war cries of savage Indians. He piled up armfuls of dry grass, he sat aflame, and once more put distance between himself and where he had been. At his next mooring place, he crawled beneath his wagon to escape the moon's scrutiny and managed only fitful sleep, chased in his dreams by bands of horse-riding skeletons wearing feather headdresses and brandishing bloody hand axes. Nightmares <clears throat> had so far been Gideon's only compensation for his dealings with the dead. When he waked, the enormous sky was faintly light in the east. The direction he would have guessed was west, so turned about was he from all his relocations the night just passed. Well, chief, how did you sleep? He examined his bony companion in the light of dawn. Your cronies run at, rode after my scalp all night long. No doubt you claim credit for my escape. The breeze sang a soft tune over the grass and faintly whistled through tiny gaps between the chief's teeth, giving voice to his assent. All right. So long as you keep away savages and bad spirits, you can rest your bones in my wagon bed and see the sights with me. Gideon reaffixed the chief's hand and with knife probe and grass brush cleaned out his joints and sockets. You could use a good washing, but you'll have to wait for the next water hole. After a breakfast of beans and coffee, they continued on their way. His Indian passenger was as congenial as his oxen. The wagon bumped and bounced along, and Chief Bone's skull jiggled and rattled, 
nodding agreement with whatever Gideon said. The skull's yellowed maw was fixed with a look of sage understanding. Having determined he had found the perfect critic, his own Boswell, he vowed he would test on the chief the effects of impressions he entered in his journal. Chief, you're welcome to applaud, but should I read you something you don't like, keep your opinion to yourself. <clears throat> Uh, Jill's craft lecture our first evening put a big lump in my throat that then she made me laugh around. And I remain deeply moved by her words and by her suggestion of mother as a source of fiction. My mother outlived my father by three decades. Her death a little over a year ago rekindled memories of my daddy's death after which I began this story solely to exercise my grief. I had no idea it would be anything I would share with others. This was going into the fire. But almost as soon as I began writing, the narrator distanced himself and became a character in some ways similar to me, yet altogether different. And then a figure slipped in from an old country gospel song, The Wreck on the Highway, and the story turned into a consciously shaped thing. It's been several years since I read this story. The last time I did, a girl in the audience fiercely waved her hand the moment I finished. Why, she said, didn't he use his cell phone? <laughs> when I wrote this, I had no idea cell phones were going to be ubiquitous. I saw no reason to slip in a marker that this takes place in ancient times <laughs> when we used rotary dialed landline phones and when long distance calls cost extra. The technological changes I've seen make Mary Jo's lecture resonate. Change, my mother always said, is God's way of helping us not mind dying so much. In college, a professor once told me, one may never write about brothers who fight on opposite sides of the Civil War. So that inspired me to have in Tejano identical twin brothers who fight on opposite sides of the Civil War. And that same professor dictated that in a poem, one may never rhyme breath with death. And I hope in this story you'll note how I surreptitiously managed to do that. <clears throat> the story's title comes from Beckett's novel, Malloy, and it pleased me after I'd published this story to pick up a book of photo text by Wright Morris, who's one of my literary heroes, and see that Morris had been struck enough by those same lines that he used them as the epigraph for that book. From things about to disappear, I turn away in time to watch them out of sight. No, I can't do it. Things about to disappear. After nine months of sickness, slipping away from us a little more every day, my daddy died. Finally, the cancer got an artery, it burst, and he went out in a rush. We buried him on a windy limestone hill beneath the twisted live oak. It was a time of leaving the tail end of a sad summer. He was gone and I was going, leaving Texas again. I drove east. The air through the car windows felt like the outdoor side of a window air conditioner. And I smell the wet air, sticky, East Texas hot. I'd already left one landscape behind. In the few hours I'd been driving, white caliche dirt had turned red. Rugged hills had smoothed out, gotten more civilized, more used looking. 
Brown grass had grown green, and every mile the trees got straighter and taller. I had been through Buffalo, Tucker, Palestine, Ironton, Jacksonville. I had crossed the Trinity River way south of Trinidad where I used to cross. Used to pass the pink motel all alone at the end of the narrow old bridge and the fertilizer plant nearly hidden in live oaks on the other side of the river. Once I'd told a friend the Trinidad fertilizer plant was really a secret laboratory where strange beings from another world were collecting and processing human blood for their dying race. The aliens had taken human form and lived in the pink motel. The tall, futuristic-looking water towers were really full of blood. The boxcars on the railroad siding brought in bodies. The brown smoke was from burning flesh. My friend and I made a secret pact if either of us never eated, needed the other, all we had to do was send a note. Trinidad Aliens, midnight, December 12th. We would never forget. Now I don't even have an address to send the note to. And they have widened the highway at Trinidad, torn down the scary, wonderful old bridge, and cut out most of the live oaks that used to make the fertilizer plant so mysterious, a secret alien laboratory. After the Trinity, I crossed the Natchez, not enough water in the Natchez to make one good tear. I left it behind, dry, waiting for water forever, for all I knew. I had two rivers left, two rivers more I knew, the little Angelina, the Sabine. The sun was in the west in the rear view mirror, sundown behind me and darkness coming ahead of me. Lights on in New York, dinner dishes done in Washington, drive-in movies dancing on in small towns all over Virginia, if you could see that far ahead. As the road rose and fell in the piney hills, I held and lost that last summer sun, leave-taking. I was playing it to the hilt. The tires were whining up and down the hills like a pedal steel guitar, and all the old sad songs about leaving were running like an old slow record in my head, and I was holding the names of places sweet in my mouth, shaping them with my lips, feeling their flavor like hard candy on my tongue. Melodies of names, names like Dripping Springs, Round Mountain, Marble Falls, Spicewood, Calf Creek, Air. Names that echoed when I thought them. San Saba, Cherry Spring, Mountain Home, Morris Ranch, Stonewall, Blanco. And the name of the man who had left me, the man I was leaving behind, his name I couldn't speak, and the name that rhymed with breath and was forever. Now there were warning signs, and all down one side of the highway were bright orange tags on tall pines, tags the color of sunset, and then no trees at all, just a wide red gash, and the dark fingers of stubborn stumps and silent orange earth movers parked in the mud. I topped a hill, and a slow black car appeared in front of me, weaving back and forth, shoulder to shoulder, covering the whole road. I couldn't see through the glare of the last crack of sun, caught on the rear window and flashing as the car careened back and forth in front of me. I honked my horn and flashed my lights, but the car meandered on like the dry riverbed of the Natchez. Then, sudden as a dream, the car jerked left, shot off the shoulder, and went through a sawhorse barricade where new lanes were being built over a ditch. Broken boards flew up over me like puppets yanked off a stage, 
and the car shot out onto a new white slab and up into the air like one of the spaceships I had imagined the aliens landed at Trinidad. And the car stopped there in the air, nose up, and that second caught and held for me like the car held in air. And I saw these things, a bird gliding just before it dives, a kite the second its string breaks, a falling leaf, a thrown stick, a fish jumping and caught in the sun, a balsa wood plane at the end of a dip or turn, a man shot out of a circus cannon, a pole vaulter, high jumper, lips puckered, muscles tensed, eyes closed, suspended over a bar, wooden rocker runners tipped almost vertical, the crest of a wave curling like a horn back into itself, a last breath held maybe forever. Then the car rolled slowly over and fell gracelessly across the ditch, hitting the soft mud with an ugly sound, someone breaking wind, nose blown, phlegm spat. The windshield popped out whole and shot like a clipped fingernail across the ditch. And I was caught there, dead still on the road. Should I go down to the car upside down in the ditch, surely flattened, surely full of death? Was there anything I could do down there? Should I keep going to the nearest telephone, call help, an ambulance, wrecker, cutting torches, then with help on its way, then go back to pull the bodies out? By the time I realized I'd made the decision, I was a mile down the road, the black car invisible behind me. A white frame house sat among pecan trees off to my right. Furiously, I skidded up under the trees, nuts popping beneath my tires, emergency brake locking sticks and nuts and porch boards snapping and cracking and creaking beneath my feet and the noise but not the feeling of the screen door beneath my fist knocking. The screen was hooked, the door behind it open. I smelled the rust of the screen wire I pressed my face against. I imagined the red mesh net crosses, crosshairs printed on my skin. I looked in and yelled through my cupped hands. Inside, a silver electric fan silently turned back and forth like the face of a robot. On a couch, a woman with white hair and wearing a white slip lay. I shouted for her to get up, to open the door. I banged, pulled at the screen until one screw came out of the handle and it turned sideways in my hand. Inside, in a doorway to another room, I saw two big bare feet sticking out into the air. I yelled at them, come here, this is an emergency, get up. I drew back my fist, held a second like the car in the air was gonna punch a hole in the screen and unlatch the door when it swung open against my chest, toppling me back a step. An old, old man stood there, dark wool pants, white undershirt, a long pink face and empty blue eyes. The face of a rabbit, long white rabbit feet on the bare floor. I hurried past him thinking for a second there would be no phone. Then I saw it black on a white doily on the dresser and I started dialing O oh, and talking at the same time to the old, old rabbit man to the body on the couch in the front room, to the nasal voice in the telephone. Who will pay for the call, sir? I'll pay, I said. I yelled my home phone number, cursed. I yelled, emergency, emergency. And again, I was caught, suspended in the moment. Feeling the distance, the air in the receiver, in my ear, the feel and sound of a seashell. I saw all these things. A blue and white telephone book for Troop, Price, Laneville, New Summerfield, 
Gallatin, and Reclaw. The maple headboard and the bed that had a white chenille spread with the long shape of a body on it. A pink and white ceramic cat on the dresser by the telephone. Two snapshots in the edge of the dresser mirror, one of a tall man and a tall woman in front of a fig tree, one of a younger tall man holding a rope stringer of fish out before his chest, holding the stringer with both hands so it curved across his chest, imitating the grin across his face, the fish catching light in the photograph like long sharp teeth. A calendar stuck with two red thumbtacks into the light blue wall. A bright, a bright autumn picture above the days of the week. Two brown spotted bird dogs holding a point forever. The operator wanted to know if I wanted the state police in Jacksonville or Henderson. For a second, I could not remember where I was. Had I passed New Summerfield? Had I crossed the Angelina River? I hadn't passed the river. Then the police in Jacksonville wanted to know where I was. I gave them the highway number and started to hang up when the tiny voice in the telephone, irritated, said, east or west of Jacksonville? East, I said. I was sure of that. How far east? Not far, I said. Just drive east. We're the only wreck on this stretch of the highway. <laughs> the old man stood in the doorway. He hadn't spoken a word, just stared without comprehension. Skin hung in folds under his arms. I told him this was an emergency. I left some money to pay for the phone call if the phone company charged him, to pay for the screen door handle. I left, the woman still on the couch, unmoving, the fan still moving right to left like a beacon across the room. There were no curtains for it to ripple as it passed back and forth, only the steady turning to prove it was on at all, that and the way I could see blue wall through the spinning blades. By the time I got back to the accident, there were several cars stopped, people standing around. I parked and hurried down the incline, slipping in the mud. One wheel of the wrecked car was still spinning. The exposed underside of the car tilted toward me. A little girl was keeping the wheel going, prodding it with a piece of broken sawhorse. The windshield was stuck up like a monolith in the mud, still intact. All around, sticking up out of the grass or lying in the mud were parts of the wreckage. A headlight, road map, thermos, hubcap, pieces of clothing, a suitcase, a woman's purse. A small boy sat in the grass holding his head, blood all down his arm. A man in a brown suit, the cuffs of his pants splashed with mud, and a long grass stain down the front of his white shirt like a green necktie walked around and around the overturned car. The car had been thrown across the ditch like a bridge so that the roof stuck down into the ditch instead of being flattened. And every few seconds, the man bent down and looked up into the car, making little clucking noises in his throat. One of the rear tires had a big hole in it. The other three tires were as bald as a man in overalls who kept sticking his fist into the hole in the rear tire and saying, they's damn lucky they wasn't killed. They's damn lucky they wasn't killed. A man in a straw hat was squatted down by the car, and I went down to him. I saw it happen. I went on to call for an ambulance. Is the little boy hurt bad? There's a woman pinned in there, he said. I sent a car back to Jacksonville for an ambulance. Should have been here by now. Maybe we ought to pull her out. If she's got internal injuries, we shouldn't move her, and... 
There's no way of knowing, I said. A man came down yelling, what happened here? Let me through, what happened? The man in the straw hat told him there was a woman pinned inside the car. I've got a hearse up there, the newcomer said. I drive for the funeral home in Palestine. We can get her in there and I'll drive her to the hospital. He got down against the fender and started pushing. The man in the straw hat was pushing by the door and the bald-headed man took his fist out of the blown tire and helped them push. I stood back, afraid to get in the way, hoping they didn't do more harm than good. Then the bald-headed man disappeared into the car. It was dark now. Fireflies blinked farther down the ditch near the woods. Someone had pulled a pickup over and aimed the lights down onto the wreck and dust danced in the beams of the headlights. The three men were dragging a woman out of the car. Her white high-heeled pumps glowed in the space where the windshield had been. I went over to the man in the brown suit, her husband, I guessed. He was trying to pick up strewn clothes from the suitcase that had been thrown from the car. Can I help you, I asked. I got to get Elizabeth's dress folded up. I tried to get him to sit down, but he kept talking about Elizabeth's dress. A woman came over and said, He's probably in shock. He'd be okay after a while. I asked her about the little boy, and she said he was okay too, just a cut on the forehead and scared silly. I told her about seeing the accident and that I'd call the police. They're never there when you need them, are they, she said. I felt silly standing there watching with the circle of onlookers, others who had stopped, Boys in Levi's, men in business suits and overalls, women in dresses, one girl in a bright pink two-piece bathing suit that caught the light from the pickup and glowed like teeth and fingernails in a bar with black lights. She was talking to three boys who were sharing their beers with her. I went back up the slope to see if I could help the man from the funeral home who had some people lifting an empty coffin from the hearse. They set it across a couple of remaining sawhorses, and he lifted the satin-covered foam pad out of the bottom. As they disappeared down the slope, carrying the coffin pad like a stretcher, I saw the moon coming up deep red on the far side of the highway, and from an opened car door, came the tinny sound of an Oklahoma radio station's call letters, and then guitar and fiddle as someone sang about love lost for all time. The woman came, feet first, out from inside the wrecked car. When her face appeared, it was white and puffy, her hair blue-black against the satin pad they laid her on. She moaned over and over a monotone. Moaned and moaned the whole time they carried up her up the hill to the highway. Moaned and moaned as they put her into the hearse. Moaned until the heavy rear door clunked shut and blocked out the sound. The man in the brown suit would not leave the car in Elizabeth's dress. So the man in the straw hat picked up the little boy and put him in the front of the hearse with the driver. The boy was crying and screaming, Mommy and Daddy, Daddy, when the big dark hearse chrome shining in the headlights of the pickup swung around and disappeared down the dark highway. The police and the ambulance still had not come. People began to leave. The moon was higher, turning ivory, Moonlight getting brighter as headlights went out and cars drove away. Finally, only a couple talking with the man down by his wrecked car remained, and I was alone on the shoulder of the highway. Moonlight had moved onto the trunk of a tall sycamore tree, the bark soft and lovely, 
splotches of soft browns and whites, like the soft hide of a pinto pony, a delicate birthmark. It reminded me of the old man's rabbit face, and I wondered if the woman had moved from the couch, if the fan still turned regularly back and forth if the old, old man had lain back down into the shape of himself on the white bedspread beneath the snapshot of his young self, grinning down with long pointed fish teeth. And I remembered my daddy in the last week of his last brave month. Remembered the evening I walked into the bedroom where he lay lost in the big double bed disappearing before our very eyes, his arm going up like a chicken wing plucked and washed for frying, his skinny elbow over his eye, tears running down his sharp, bony cheek. Don't see me this way, son, please don't. His face gone, only bones were left. Huge white eyes, nose, teeth, a medieval woodcut of death. I remembered holding his long, thin fingers, how cool and dry they were, how soft, how much love I felt through those thin pads of his fingers, felt them twitch and tremble with pain and sadness. He smiled at me, his lips unnaturally wide and pink, in his disappearing face. The double windows in which the sickness had made him see men from outer space, aliens from another world, who stood outside the windows or just walked right through the glass and stood around his bed watching him. Those same windows growing dark, the soft gray of slate when he called me in. He asked me to look and tell him what I saw. Didn't I see that spaceship in the backyard? When I asked if they were after him, he said he didn't know, they just stood watching. They were four young men with short hair and dark pants and white shirts and dark ties. And they stood, arms folded across their chests, around his bed, watching him. He could make them disappear with his flashlight. That last evening we talked, the stone gray squares of the windows, the soft light of an early evening in late summer smoothed the angles of his protruding bones, softened the ravages of the cancer that was eating him even as we looked at each other, the soft dim light giving him back for a moment his strong arms and full tanned face. And he said, you know, son, while I'm lying here, the past sort of floats by like a good old movie. And I thought I'd reach out and grab some of it and give it to you. I remembered suffering because I couldn't make him whole again, because I didn't have some magic thing to say to him. And he went on. For instance, when I was a kid, and here he stretched out his arm toward the windows and the yard beyond, where I heard for the first time all summer the cicadas in the live oak. We used to call them, what are those Cicadas, I said. Yeah, that's right. We used to call them crickadees, and he spelled it for me. And he told me that since I like words, he thought I might like a word like crickadees. And I tore off a piece of paper from the telephone pad on his bedside table and wrote it down and folded it up and put it in my wallet where it still is, crickadees smelling like leather and sweat. Feeling my wallet tight against my hip, I walked down to the man in the brown suit and the couple who had stayed to wait with him for the police and asked if he wanted my name and address as a witness or something. 
He said he guessed he didn't need it. And the woman with him thanked me, but said she and her husband lived nearby. They could explain to the police. So I got back into my car and drove on into the darker east, past the white frame house where perhaps two old people would imagine they dreamt about a frightened young man who came and tried to wake them, past two state police cars, lights flashing, headed west where I had come from. Wondering about the wreck, whether the woman was badly hurt, and about what would become of the man and the little boy, I drove on across the lovely little Angelina River through New Summerfield, away from the people who had given me my past and to whatever future I could find in the dark distances ahead, listening for crickets and loving so many things that were about to disappear. <laughs>